was fun and beautiful too. After Jesus, the first century followers of Jesus were apparently known in some areas as followers of the way. And many of us think of Christianity as something that kind of just happened organically right after Jesus, immediately. But remember that there was no such thing yet as Christianity. Constantine did not make the faith of Jesus' followers a legal religion until 311 of the Common Era. So the way of Jesus was a sort of ethic, a way of living that was patterned after the man Jesus of Nazareth. It was not so much a religion for more than two centuries. From this ethical way of living then came the religion of Christianity. Of course, the ideal religion always demands a certain ethical aspect. And that's why something like the golden rule is found in the teaching of most all major faiths and why the World Parliament of Religions has been able to articulate a golden and global ethic. In Radigan Hall, a Norman Rockwell depiction of the Golden Rule is um, there hanging just as you enter into the door, and it's stated in most of the major religions. Here are some of the sayings that are depicted around the world. From Buddhism, hurt not others with that which pains yourself. From Hinduism, this is the sum of duty. Do not to others which if done to thee would cause thee pain. From Islam, no one of you is a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. From Sikhism, As thou deemest thyself, so deem others. Then thou shalt become a partner in heaven. From Zoroastrianism, that nature only is good when it shall not do unto another whatever is not good for its own self. And from the Hebrew tradition, what is hurtful to yourself do not to your fellow man. That is the whole of the Torah, and the remainder is but commentary. Go learn it. So to be relevant to our contemporary word, world, I'm sorry, the younger generations are demanding that people of faith actually act in ways that are consistent with what they say they believe. And it's no longer acceptable for church folk to talk the talk without walking the walk. Ethics addresses at least two questions. How ought we to live? And what kind of person ought we to be? Progressive theologians subscribe to situational or contextual ethics instead of prescribing moral rules. In other words, instead of simply following the laws, progressive Christians and progressive thinkers are asked to prioritize the common good. They argue that this is what Jesus meant when he said that the greatest commandment is what? To love, love God, and love neighbor. Mm -hmm. So a progressive ethic is relational. You all wanted to quote the whole scripture. I was going to just boil it down to love God, love neighbor. So this progressive ethic that Jesus taught, it's relational. It puts its focus on the quality of relationships rather than the legal definition of what's right and wrong. And this is according to a premier ethicist and Christian teacher, Dr. Noel Preston, who is an ethicist, theologian, and social commentator. He says that to love as Jesus taught, 
requires right relating, relating rightly to ourselves, to our families, to our communities, our God, and then ultimately to the earth itself. And 1 Peter 4, verses 8 to 11 speaks to this ethic. Actually, many biblical texts speak to it, but I picked this one. It's printed in your bulletin if you want to follow along. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is what Noel Peters, or Preston wrote about the difference that it makes to progressives when we understand right relationships. And I quote, freed from the need to dominate and empowered to trust the processes of life, a different, holistic, and egocentric way may open up in which the primary focus is on right relating in the community of life. The key to this happening is the realization that we human beings are not the center of creation, that life is much bigger than our individual failures and successes, and that our nobility as a species is contingent on us relating rightly from a position of responsible dependence within the biosphere. Then, loving our neighbor includes loving nature, then unconditional love, grace, or life abundant may begin to fill the earth, for grace is that which is ultimately life-giving, allowing and enabling us to be who we really are. A woman that I'm thinking about was in her 60s when she told me. She said it happened when she was about 12. Her mother and father were always chatty at supper. They had a large family, a lot of kids, and supper time, well, I call it supper, some people call it dinner, but at supper time, they all just had a good time. Everybody was laughing and talking when it happened. And what was good and what was bad and this and that, mom talking, dad talking, the kids all ta talking, well, it was just a wonderful time. Just before supper, mom and dad got into it, she said. I'd never seen them like that. I never heard them talk to each other like that. Their faces were red. They screamed at each other. Then they saw us kids waiting for supper, and it got very quiet. Mama said, sit down, let's eat. We all sat down, and it was quiet as a graveyard. Nobody talked during supper. Nobody talked at breakfast. Nobody talked at lunch. Nobody. She told me for about three weeks, nobody spoke at any meal, and mom and dad didn't speak. And after about three weeks, she said they began to be civil to each other, but their home was never the same again. It can happen in homes. It can happen in friendship groups. It can happen in neighborhoods. It can happen in congregations. Right relating is at the center of all ethical responsibilities, says Noel Preston, 
personal and social, rightly relating to ourselves, our families, our communities, our God, and to the earth itself. He says that this ethic is guided by compassion. And compassion is to be given to, again, ourselves, our families, our community, our God, and the earth. Compassion is to guide us in our right relationships, valuing the interests of all, especially the most vulnerable. And the way I see it, following the Ten Commandments, that'd be an easier proposition, don't you agree? (laughs) I like the Ten Commandments, don't kill, don't steal, don't covet. Those are much easier than tending to right relationships and having compassion. Following laws and rules, that's straightforward. Right relating and offering compassion, well, it requires the work of the heart. And that's not always straightforward. And it's very demanding emotionally. Right relations calls for maturity and boldness. You all have lived long enough to know what I'm saying. Right relations call for going straight to the person involved instead of talking to others when you hear something. If you hear something and then later you talk on the phone to a person about someone else, right relations means going directly to the person you heard it about and talking to them and getting the facts, not talking to the third person. Right relations calls for standing up against gossip, even if the gossip is well-meaning. You know, when someone calls you with a concern and you know that they are truly concerned, but you're not totally certain about the reality of the story, you have to check out the truth with the person it's about before sharing the story with anyone else. Otherwise, you're participating in the gossip, even if it was well-intended. Right relations calls for setting the record straight. When you hear something about someone else and you wonder if it doesn't sound quite right, ask them, ask the real first person about their side of the story and then set the record straight with the person in the first party. Try to heal those relationships. Right relations calls for compassion of the heart and forgiveness when someone does something that's hurtful. None of us is perfect. Now, of course, we don't have to put up with repeated wrong behavior. But when someone makes a mistake and apologizes, or when someone makes a mistake that's out of character, being forgiving and compassionate is a faithful response. Finally, this ethic that Noel Preston says of right relation applies to social justice and is eco-centric. It's radically inclusive, and it's committed to the common good. According to him, a transformative ethic presumes that when we sign up to be a progressive Christian, we must find ways to work for social and public good for the resources of the earth, because they belong to all of earth's beings, including, of course, the future generations. Father Thomas Berry said, we have no inner spiritual life if we do not have the outer experience of a beautiful world. The more we destroy the world, the less a sense of God is possible. In other words, the heart of an ecocentric spirituality the compassion, the love, the sense of justice, all of that stems from a deep inner awareness that one is all and all is one. 
That is a profound sense of the interconnectedness and interconnectedness, relatedness of the community of life. Right now is a great place. This is a great town to drive and find the interconnectedness of life. Have you driven down 29th and seen the leaves? If you can't experience the awe of nature, right now is a perfect time to do that. Over here, there are some orange trees peeking through our windows. It's a lovely time to experience the oneness of nature and God, the eco-centric time of life. Take a moment this week to realize how connected we are in compassion, in creation, in spiritual life to the world and to one another. Thanks be to God. Amen.